why is it important to talk about hypertension as it relates to pregnancy? To date, hypertensive disorders remain one of the top causes of maternal mortality. Hypertensive disorders complicate 5 to 8% of pregnancies worldwide annually. This results in a staggering 76,000 maternal deaths and 500,000 infant deaths worldwide annually. With rates of hypertensive disorders rising and the negative impact continuing to be great, it is important that all of us caring for women during childbearing are well equipped as to avoid the associated morbidity and mortality. We are going to be focusing on three specific ideas today. First, prevention of maternal mortality as it relates to hypertensive disorders. Second, treatment and guidelines for acute severe hypertension. And third, the impact of racial disparities on hypertensive disorders. Let's start with the discussion with our first key idea, prevention of maternal mortality as it relates to hypertensive disorders. A staggering 700 women die each year in the United States as, it, as a result of pregnancy complications. When comparing maternal mortality rates in the United States to other developed countries, mortality rates are nearly three times or more than that of other developed countries, as we can see depicted in this graph. The United States is the only developed nation with rising maternal rates annually compared to other countries that have shown a steady decline in rates. In addition, there still remains racial disparities that significantly impact the U.S. rates. What we see here is a very powerful depiction of the annual death toll in the United States, with each number representing a maternal life loss due to pregnancy complications. So what are the causes of pregnancy-related deaths in the United States that contribute most to the 700 per year toll? One of eight births in the United States occurs in California. So, with such a robust amount of pregnancy data, the California Pregnancy Associated Mortality Review, which is a multidisciplinary committee, reviewed medical records, autopsy reports, and coroner reports of the pregnancy-related deaths between 2011 and 2014 to determine cause of death, clinical and demographic characteristics, chance to alter outcome, contributing factors, and quality improvement opportunities. The five leading causes of death were compared with each other and with the overall California birth population. As you can see, hypertensive disorders rank among the highest causes along with cardiac disease, thromboembolism, and hemorrhage, among others. In addition, the committee found that 41% of pregnancy-related deaths were noted to be preventable. And of those preventable cases, 60% were due to preeclampsia and related hypertensive disorders. The next important question to ask is, of conditions that are known causes of maternal mortality, what conditions lead the way in deaths due to the delay in response to warning signs? Hypertensive disorders are definitely one of those answers to this question. The population attributable fraction, or PAF, is a measure that epidemiologists widely use to assess the public health impact of exposures in populations. PAF is defined as the fraction of all cases in a particular disease or other adverse condition in a population that is attributable to a specific exposure. When looking at severe preeclampsia, the PAF is staggering as it relates to the listed comorbidities, meaning that exposure to severe preeclampsia accounts for a significant portion of these cases. For instance, when taking into account acute renal failure, 38.1% of cases are attributable to severe preeclampsia. We can no longer ignore the elephant in the room. Preeclampsia, especially severe preeclampsia, is associated with a significant risk of stroke. Although rare, at a rate of 34.2 cases per 100,000, the mortality rate is high at 10 
to 13%. Intracranial hemorrhage is more common in the pregnant population compared to the non-pregnant population at the same age. This is due to the fact that there is increased risk of intracranial hemorrhage at lower systolic blood pressures in pregnant and postpartum women. Stroke is most likely to occur at the time of delivery, followed by more immediate postpartum time frame of two days to six weeks. In the setting of preeclampsia, stroke is 12 times more likely to occur than in those without a diagnosis of preeclampsia. Now that you have a clear understanding of the gravity of maternal mortality, especially in the United States, and the most common causes, let's dive into our second topic. I can recall a patient who presented to our triage area with a complaint of headache. Her history was significant for obesity and migraine headaches. She stated recent stress due to the concern for a fetal anomaly and the delay in getting a planned imaging study scheduled to assess the baby's condition. During the triage visit, she was noted to have mildly elevated blood pressures. The physician assessing the patient assumed the headache and blood pressures were related to her current stressful situation and documented it as such before discharging her home. She returned 48 hours later with abdominal pain and bleeding and was subsequently diagnosed with a fetal demise, secondary to a placental abruption caused by preeclampsia with severe features. When discussing the treatment of severe hypertension, one of the first questions that naturally arises is what are some of the risks of severe hypertension in pregnancy? Hypertensive disorders of pregnancy remain a major health issue for women and their infants in the United States. Preeclampsia, either alone or superimposed on preexisting or chronic hypertension, presents the major risk. Risks to the mother include death, myocardial infarction, and placental abruption, among others. Risks to the fetus and neonate include preterm delivery, growth restriction, and perinatal death, among others. Hypertensive disorders are divided into five main categories. The first, chronic hypertension, or hypertension diagnosed prior to the start of pregnancy, or within the first five months of pregnancy. Second, gestational hypertension and preeclampsia without severe features. These are mild hypertensive disorders of pregnancy diagnosed at or beyond the 20th week of pregnancy. Third, chronic hypertension with superimposed preeclampsia, and that's diagnosed preeclampsia in the setting of a patient with a known history of chronic hypertension. And lastly, preeclampsia with severe features, the severest form of hypertensive disorders that is associated with high risk of severe complications. Each category involves a significant rise in blood pressure as part of the diagnosis, along with details listed here. Early diagnosis and appropriate management are key to decreasing the risk of complications and adverse outcomes. Persistent severe hypertension in pregnancy is defined as a systolic blood pressure of 160 or greater occurring on two separate readings at least 15 minutes apart, or a diastolic blood pressure of 110 or greater occurring on two separate readings at least 15 minutes apart. Prompt recognition and treatment of severe hypertension is important as there is increased risk of severe morbidity with delayed treatment and prompt treatment has been proven to improve outcomes. Blood pressure naturally declines during the first two trimesters and reaches its lowest at approximately 24 weeks. There is a slow increase in the early third trimester and a return to baseline at term. Patients with pre-existing hypertension will exhibit a greater percentage decrease in blood pressure during pregnancy. Therefore, obtaining an accurate blood pressure reading is key and should involve the following. The patient should be in the seated position with legs flat and a bare upper arm for five to 10 minutes. And this is prior to taking the blood pressure. 
Appropriate cuff size use is key. When making a manual blood pressure, use the first and last audible sound, perform two additional readings at least one minute apart, and record the highest reading. If there is a blood pressure elevation noted, repeat it within 30 minutes, and if there is continued elevation, the patient should be fully evaluated for preeclampsia. Patients should not be repositioned to either side, as this can influence the blood pressure measurement and cause readings that are falsely lowered. And even though this may be comforting, it is not reassuring and can cause significant delays in appropriate care. In 2017, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or ACOG, released official guidelines on the management of acute severe hypertension or hypertensive emergency that has since evolved into a maternal safety bundle. ACOG makes the following recommendations and conclusions as it relates to hypertension management in pregnancy. Introducing standardized evidence-based clinical guidelines for the management of patients with preeclampsia and eclampsia has demonstrated to reduce the incidence of adverse maternal outcomes. Another question that often arises is what is the optimal time for treatment of acute severe hypertension? Is it 15 minutes or 30 minutes or even 60 minutes? ACOG recommends that treatment with first-line agents should be expeditious and occur as soon as possible within 30 to 60 minutes of confirmed severe hypertension to reduce the risk of maternal stroke. The ultimate goals in the management of severe hypertension are to prevent end organ damage, avoid eclampsia, and treat promptly. Achieving normal blood pressures should not be the goal, but instead the aim should be to lower blood pressures to a safer range. Normal tensive blood pressures in these patients may lead to hypoperfusion. In discussing severe hypertension, it is important to spend time discussing the most appropriate medications for treatment. There are three medications used for the treatment of acute severe hypertension, labetalol, hydralazine, and nifedipine. Each are equally effective in management, considered first-line agents, and are safe for use in pregnancy. Different patients respond differently to treatment so choice is typically left to the provider based on experience and comfort in the absence of contraindications. Labetalol is given intravenously in increments of 20 to 80 milligrams for a maximum of 300 milligrams in a 24 hour period. Use should be avoided in patients with pulmonary edema, heart failure, and severe asthma given the mechanism of action. Hydralazine is given intravenously in increments of 5 or 20 milligrams for a maximum of 30 milligrams in a 24-hour period. Rarely, patients may have a lupus-like reaction. Immediate release nifedipine is given orally in increments of 10 or 20 milligrams for a maximum of 120 milligrams in a 24-hour period. Nifedipine is known to be a risk factor for cardiovascular morbid morbidity and mortality in adults with coronary artery disease. These antihypertensive medication options have varying mechanisms of action, but ultimately reach the same goal of lowering blood pressure quickly in the acute setting. Each has a different onset of action that should be taken into consideration when choosing the agent and deciding to redose or switch to a different agent. Nifedipine immediate release has a buckle formation option with an onset of action of one to five minutes. Magnesium sulfate is a vital part of treatment of severe hypertension as it is the drug of choice for prevention of eclamptic seizures. Neuroprophylaxis with magnesium sulfate should be started immediately and in parallel with antihypertensive treatment as patients are being stabilized. The recommended dose is a bolus of four to six grams, followed
followed by a continuous infusion at a rate of two grams per hour. Care should be taken in patients with decreased renal function and alter alternative dosing should be undertaken. The recommended dose is a bolus of four to six grams followed by a continuous infusion at a rate of two grams per hour. Care should be taken in patients with decreased renal function and alternative dosing should be undertaken. Giving boluses of four milligrams every four hours or running a rate of one gram per hour following a four gram bolus should be considered. ACOG has provided treatment algorithms as guidance for medical man management of acute hypertension. These algorithms are easily adoptable to any institution. If severe elevations defined as systolic blood pressure equal to or greater than 160 or diastolic blood pressure equal to or greater than 110 persist for 15 minutes or more or if severe elevations, two to be total, are obtained within 15 minutes, an algorithm should be triggered to assure prompt treatment. Labetalol should be given in 10 minute intervals with a transition to another agent if no response after the third dose. Hydralazine should be given in 20 minute intervals with a transition to another agent if no response after the second dose. Nifedipine should be given in 20 minute intervals with a transition to another agent if no response after the third dose. At this point, you may be thinking that committing to use of a structured system for the treatment of acute hypertension is a big undertaking and really not necessary. Do guidelines really matter? The short answer is yes. Clark et al. looked into the impact of treatment protocols on maternal death rates as it related to pulmonary embolism and preeclampsia. What they found was that with implementation of checklist-based protocols for the treatment and recognition of preeclampsia, the number of deaths related to preeclampsia decreased significantly from 15 to 3. But what do these guidelines for treatment look like in real life? This sample guideline demonstrates an optimal way to all aspects of treatment to assure that there are not significant delays in management or missed management opportunities. The guideline alerts all to the diagnostic criteria and the appropriate way to obtain this information. The medical management options and the appropriate way to administer the antihypertensive medications, and the steps to assure there are no gaps in other aspects of care for the patient, such as fetal surveillance and initiation of magnesium are listed. Once blood pressure thresholds and goals are achieved, blood pressure should be monitored closely in longer intervals as continued stabilization is verified. Anesthesia should be aware of the patient and can be of great assistance with IV line access or arterial line placement if the blood pressure cuff is not given accurate readings. As we discussed previously, most strokes related to preeclampsia and eclamptic seizures happen around the time of delivery and the more immediate postpartum period. Therefore, patients should be monitored closely for the first 48 to 72 hours ideally in the inpatient setting. In addition, follow-up in the outpatient setting should take place seven to 10 days following discharge. In summary, because maternal mortality and morbidity related to hypertension is rare, but a significant contributor to the rising morbidity and mortality in the United States, treatment for acute severe hypertension reduces morbidity and mortality significantly. Pregnant women may stroke at a lower blood pressure than non-pregnant women. Women without spontaneous resolution of severe hypertension should be treated within 60 minutes. Women with systolic blood pressures greater than 180 are less likely to have spontaneous resolution of acute hypertension and should be treated without further assessment.
There may be a role for rechecking blood pressure and holding antihypertensive medication if non-severe pressures follow. This does not appear to increase duration of exposure to severe hypertension and may decrease unnecessary administration of antihypertensive therapy. And with all that we know, compliance with current guidelines, especially ACOG guidelines, is poor. Guidelines do have potential pitfalls, including improper assessment of blood pressure, too frequent or infrequent checking of blood pressure, giving oral abetalol as a first-line treatment, not having medication readily available, and inadequate nursing staff for frequent blood pressure monitoring, and no policies for administering magnesium sulfate without an order. And even with the best laid out guideline, only 37% of patients receive treatment within 60 minutes. Let's discuss our final point today, the impact of racial disparities on hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Is there a race at a higher risk of hypertension during pregnancy in the United States? The simple answer is yes. Disparities have persisted over time and across age groups. They are present even in states with the lowest pregnancy-related mortality ratios and among groups with higher levels of education. This graphic depicts the variation in the cost-specific proportion of pregnancy-related deaths by race or ethnicity. During 2007 through 2016, Black and American Indian or Alaska Native women had significantly more pregnancy-related deaths per 100,000 births than did white, Hispanic, and Asian Pacific Islander women. Racial disparities contribute to maternal morbidity in the United States. Black women are approximately three times more likely to die in the hospital during delivery admissions. This is in part due to an increased risk of stroke and cardiac failure. In the same study, it was shown that black women were over two times more likely to experience stillbirth. The effect of race or ethnicity was larger in women with chronic hypertension or pregnancy-induced hypertension. Targeting blood pressure management in pregnancy may help reduce maternal stroke risk in minority populations. And it does not stop there. Non-Hispanic black women are less likely to have appropriate postpartum follow-up, leading to increased rates of maternal mortality during this period. Intraconception care may be of great assistance in closing the disparity gaps seen. As it relates to preeclampsia, the risk of severe maternal morbidity is higher for black women. Non-Hispanic black women are more likely to have stroke, acute heart failure or pulmonary edema, eclampsia, and acute renal failure. Are there additional resources for racial disparity bundles? Yes, there are, through AIM. The goal of safety bundles is to move established guidelines into practice with a standard approach. AIM's Reduction of Peripartum Racial and Ethnic Disparities Guide aids in establishing systems to accurately document self-identified race, ethnicity, and primary language. Also to provide system-wide staff education and training on how to ask demographic intake questions to ensure that the patient understands why race, ethnicity, and language data are being collected, ensure that race, ethnicity, and language data are accessible in the electronic medical record, evaluate non-English language proficiency for providers who communicate with patients in languages other than English, educate all staff, including inpatient, outpatient, and community-based staff, on interpreter services available within the healthcare system, and provide staff-wide education on peripartum racial and ethnic disparities and their root causes, best practices for shared decision-making, engaging diverse patient, family, and community advocates who can represent important community partnerships on quality and safety leadership teams. Prevention and recognition are key to shifting the needle. 
it has to involve every patient, family, and staff member. Organizations need to provide staff-wide education on implicit bias, provide convenient access to health records without delay, add minimal to no fee to the maternal patient in a clear and simple format that summarizes information most pertinent to the care and wellness of the patient during the prenatal period, and establish a mechanism for patients, families, and staff to report inequitable care and episodes of miscommunication or disrespect. In addition, organizations need to engage in best practices for shared decision making, ensure a timely and tailored response to each report of inequity or disrespect, address reproductive life plans and contraceptive options, not only during or immediately after pregnancy, but on regular intervals throughout a woman's reproductive life, establish discharge navigation and coordination systems post-childbirth to ensure that women have appropriate follow-up care, and understand when it is necessary to return to their healthcare provider, provide discharge instructions that include information about what danger or warning signs to look out for, whom to call, and where to go if they have a question or concern. And lastly, organizations should strive to build a culture of equity, including systems for reporting response and learning similar to the ongoing efforts in the safety culture. Develop a disparities dashboard that monitors process and outcome metrics stratified by race and ethnicity with regular dissemination of the stratified performance data to staff and leadership. Implement quality improvement projects that target disparities in healthcare access, treatment, and outcomes. Consider the role of race, ethnicity, language, poverty, literacy, and other social determinants of health, including racism at the interpersonal and system level when conducting multidisciplinary reviews of severe maternal morbidity, mortality, and other clinically important metrics. And add as a checkbox on review sheets, did race or ethnicity, i.e. implicit bias, language barrier, or specific social determinants of health contribute to the morbidity? Yes, no, maybe. And if so, are there system changes that could be implemented that would alter the outcome. In conclusion, we can do better. We can make a difference. The incidence of hypertensive disease is increasing at staggering rates. Racial and ethnic disparities contribute to significant maternal morbidity and mortality. Preconception and intraconception care can assist in closing those disparity gaps. Implementation of standardized protocols can be used to improve outcomes for this population. In addition, postpartum management should be included in the routine management of patients with a history of hypertensive disorders, especially hypertensive emergencies. And now, I hope you have gained a clear understanding of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Thank you for spending your time with me today. Feel free to contact me if there are any further questions or information needed.